Hi everybody and welcome to our 10th podcast. We are in Australia, Melbourne right now and it's absolutely amazing day, sunshine and uh, it's we're nearly nearly in springtime and just everything blossoming. We've got like, I never heard so many bird noises, you know, around our area. It's just like everything is oh, just Oh yeah, but I think that's also because of the, the pandemic. pandemic. Because everybody's at home, so all the birds are coming out, which it's, is great. It's not just the birds, you know, like we just suddenly realize we've got so many different varieties of birds and we can hear any cockatoos and we can hear any kookaburras, you know, laughing at everybody at our like situation. And it's it just like, it's just like, you know, it's just amazing. And um, on one side, it's pretty sad what's happening around the world. On another side, it's just um, you know you can see we we go we we actually step step aside and uh, um, like gave opportunity for nature to blossom. Yeah. But uh, um, well, what we're going to talk well, about I was thinking, today well, about I was actually thinking about how abstract art I, I think is really unique in the sense that. But you know, it's it, really interesting talking uh, about nature, like un- unpredictability yeah. of abstract art. It's exactly like nature is unpredictable. Like any, for example, wind can create something else on another. Uh, like if wind here can create something else on on another side of a, you of see, a globe. You see, abstraction is a fundamental force. Uh, That's right. Which is, is what you're tapping into when when you're an abstract exactly, artist. Exactly. Exactly. Into and these elementary. A, it's a really really amazing because like um because I was always thinking about Aelita because you know I'm a parent and I have to discipline her because you know Aelita is not disciplined. No, it is impossible to discipline her because I from a day one I was trying to put on her shoes. It's never worked. She's thirteen now and it still didn't work. She is with a bare feet, even on at the concerts when she's uh, Yeah, but here it's her, actually cold play, in winter and she it, runs around <sighs> barefoot in winter and you can't do and anything. And she said it's warm. And that's it. Like, I, I was trying to do everything possible. No socks, no shoes. And even in the concerts when she playing her violin on her own sound paintings, she sta- stands there in a fancy dress. Well, that was so funny because she was, a, she was in a, in a, a museum, a, a traditional, an old, established, Italian. conservative, <laughs> traditional museum. And then she's running around barefoot. In, in the know, Rome, in the heart free, of Rome. Free spirit. And in her, her feet are totally dirty because she was running around the grounds before the concert. Oh, yeah, black. At the, actually, literally black, and she was in a white, beautiful dress. And, um, you know, like I was like a little bit concerned about, but it's just like impossible. She just takes the shoes off and goes and performs with the bare feet. And it's really interesting because it's all like about connection to the earth, connection to the ground. It's all like uh, freedom, 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 freedom. And it's just, uh, it's unbelievable that just like, I learned so much from Aelita because uh, you go somewhere uh, with her and it's always adventure. It's always like, you know, if Aelita is somewhere not around, where I should look for her? It's obviously in the trees, you know. Yeah, at the top of the tree. Uh, it's the top of the tree, yes, mm. 10 meters above, you know, on the top of the eucalypt. And you just like, I get in heart palpitation and I can feel like I'm, I'm, I'm just like so nervous and so stressed because it doesn't matter what happens, I won't be able to catch her. But, you know, like she's just like a monkey. She just like crawls there and it just it's it's uh, she's wow. a total free spirit it's free anyway spirit, yes. it, it, it's interesting yeah so what i wanted to talk about was and I, it's never really it's never really discussed it's just this this whole idea that abstract art is not just an expression of abstraction in and of itself like in a really closed limited way it 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 actually is constantly used and has been used to directly influence figurative art and it, it has a significant presence in figurative art and, and it also has played a really important role in conventional music. Abstract music and abstract composers and for example there's a, a German guy called Stockhausen and he uh, used to do what uh, is called music concrete so it's a, um, a, a literal translation of that means um, uh, concrete music so it's actually music made up of entirely um, natural non-conventional musical objects so you'd be using things like 
um, you know, springs or, or um, you know, bits of wood or bits of metal or bells or static from a radio, all, all these kind of um, th things in, 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 you know, around us that have nothing to do with conventional instruments. So he would never use a conventional instrument in any of his recordings. Anyway, and it was, of, of course, completely abstract because there's no sense of, uh, you know, scale or melody or uh, tonality or anything like that. But the really interesting thing is that the Beatles, I'll, I'll, I'll give one very specific example. The Beatles actually heard this uh, in the 60s. I think Paul McCartney was actually listening to this guy, Stockhausen, uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s. And he and, and of course you know the, the the 60s was kind of a really interesting uh, period, this sort of uh, transitional uh, period where where there was sort of so much um, experimentation and and sort of freedom and I don't know people were just really um, people were really conducive to new ideas and experimentation and anyway. Um, Lenin, well, I think Lenin and McCartney. It's after conservative fifties. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Well, it's obviously was like people. I was like well, it's people, like a bottle. Of, we just. It's really the interesting thing is people say the fifties were conservative, but they actually weren't because if you look at it, you know, you look at the whole James Dean thing and all that sort of thing. It was all about rebelliousness. The fifties was actually an incredible time of rebelliousness, <laughs> but on the surface, we had con we we all we all we were ever fed in sort of movies. Uh, and in the mainstream was this idea of conservatism, but underneath it was bubbling all this rebelliousness, and that probably you could say was bubbling along, and then it kind of really erupted in the 60s, uh, you, you know, and it basically uh, kind of overwhelmed uh, all, all the conservative society. So, so anyway, so what happened was that um, Lennon and McCartney were actually listening to this guy's kind of, you know, if you listen to it, it's it's really sort of crazy. It's just all these what what seems to me just comp uh, sorry what seems to be just all these really really random sounds for hours and hours on on end. But the interesting thing is because they were musically minded, they took all that away with them, and then allowed it to sort of percolate in their in their minds, and they managed to fuse it together with conventional music and they actually came out with um, uh, y you can probably hear this uh, um, most it's well it's actually evident in in several of their albums but the very famous song a day in the life from sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band is unique because the chorus is just a whole completely atonal violins it's just like noise and then it goes back to the actual song and then there's all these other moments in their songs where they're using completely unconventional musical ideas and that directly came out of their exposure to avant-garde music now the interesting thing is that you take a painter a conventional english painter like turner now if you look at a turner yeah, he, you know, he'll have all these sort of clouds and, and, and a sort of a, a stormy ocean and all this sort of thing, and there'll be a ship, uh, you know, in the middle of it. But if you hold your hand up and blot out the ship, uh, you know, or the one figurative object in it, the rest of the painting looks completely abstract. So you could say that, that a, a painting of some of the elementary forces of nature, uh, especially continually um, morphing or continually moving like like water giant bodies of water or clouds or whatever inherently look abstract and so I think even the seeds the kind of the seeds of abstraction were sort of p planted in in paintings like that where you could probably say that 90% of it is ostensibly abstract except for one figurative object. I mean, it would be like taking, you know, for example, if you took a, a pollock or something and then stuck a, um, 
a figurative object, you painted a figurative object somewhere in the middle of it, then you would immediately recontextualize the whole painting and consider it something else. You would, you would consider the object being inside some sort of specific... You would reconsider all the surroundings as not necessarily being abstract anymore, but as being the context for the the object itself so you would you you'd sort of reassess the entire image but by removing the figurative object by not having anything figurative in it we automatically call it um, abstract even though it ca could quite conceivably be just a reflection of a part of nature so that's to do with our perspective the point that i wanted to make about the relationship of abstract art to all conventional representational figurative art, uh, you know, whether it's visual or whether it's um, conventionally structured music, is that they both draw on and are influenced by and uh, can be uh, well, they can be benefited and expanded and enriched by abstract art. So in other words, the two tend to be seen as mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, on the one side, you've got abstract art, and then on the other side, you've got figurative representational art or uh, conventional music and abstract music. They all There always seems to be this division, which quite honestly, I could actually never understand, because to me, I always thought the two, the two were interrelated, but there was this generally accepted, arbitrary division uh, between the two. So I just wanted to make the point that Elita's abstract art has two very important functions, you could say, if you wanted to talk about the functionality of art. On the one hand, it is to dive into the entire world of abstraction to be totally free of conventional styles and techniques and uh, let's call it slavery to figuration to allow you to freely and independently experiment without any boundaries, without any restrictions. Then on the other hand, it serves a really crucial function to influence figurative and representational art. So in other words, the whole point is that it should be an enormous wellspring of influence and inspiration by artists who would normally operate in a purely figurative, representational, conventional area, so that uh, you know, on the one hand, they would uh, look at uh, Elita's art and maybe expand their own techniques and their own style and their own use of materials, even though it is completely in the service of strict figurative representational art or predominantly uh, figurative uh, representational art. By seeing the enormous spectrum of possibilities that abstract art presents... It becomes something that you can actually draw on and use in conventional art. And, this, and, and it, exactly the same thing applies to, which is, which is why I brought up uh, you know, the Beatles and Stockhausen. It's, it, the exact same uh, point applies to the influence of abstract music and why it's actually crucial. It's actually really criti critical to have abstract uh, to have the abstract arts in general is really, really critical. In other words, you will be drastically limiting the progress, if you like, or the possibilities of conventional music and conventional visual art or any conventional art form if you don't have a very vibrant and healthy output of abstract art. In other words, the two are necessary and they have to coexist. Uh, so that's that's just the point that I wanted to uh, end uh, the podcast on. You know, because most people, you know, I think look at look at abstract art. You know, they they look at Elita's abstract art and 
Look, a lot of people absolutely love it, and that's that's really fantastic, and and I'm so happy about that. And Elita's so glad. She it 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 makes her feel so good that there are so many people around the world that love her art for what it is. But uh, you know, I think a lot of people miss the point that Elita is also, by virtue of being an abstract artist, she's also engaging with, in a sense you could say, you could, you could say it's a, a, a latent influence in the conventional uh, arts, in the sense that it's really just waiting for somebody to come along and see the, all the possibilities of incorporating aspects of abstract art into the conventional figurative representational uh, spectrum of art creation and they both have to thrive you know in other words if if we only concentrate on one or the other like if you were to only concentrate on uh, minimalist art or conceptual art or whatever or you know something that's very conceptual or very exists in a very abstract kind of realm at the expense of conventional figurative representational then then both types of art will in the end suffer so in other words they both enrich each other and they both really really need to exist but because uh, abstract art is far less appreciated and 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 uh, you know viewed with far more suspicion you could say than conventional art there's a sort of an onus, if you like, um, to really support uh, abstraction, not only for its own sake, but of course, you know, as I was saying, for all of the benefits that it brings to conventional art. So that's just the, the point that I kind of wanted to end on for this podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Very good point. Thank you. <laughs>